The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking. I'm your host today, uh, Frank Saberic, and today we have a pretty good, um, we have a pretty interesting uh, topic here on uh, the subject of uh, sex trafficking. We have with us uh, um, a young lady named Stephanie um, Clark. Stephanie Clark, and you're the executive director of a group called Amira. Correct. Which um, basically um, handles, um, well, helps women cope with who were victims of sex trafficking. Correct. And I, I know just before we went on camera here, you, um, we were talking about, I, I was a little confused on what sex trafficking is. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, Amira, and the definition of sex trafficking, that will be a good start in the right direction here, I think. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. Well, Frank, I want to thank you for having me. Okay. And I'm so thankful that you're willing to bring about an interview about sex trafficking. Um, it's a hard subject. And so I encourage everybody that watches this show just to continue to engage about what this is. Um, and so sex trafficking, that, that term, when we think about that, sometimes we can think about you know, the movie Taken with Liam Neeson. Um, you know, that man that has a daughter that gets taken when she's traveling internationally and, um, you know, that scares parents <laughs> to death, really, um, that this could happen to them. Um, or sometimes we think about, you know, the woman, uh, uh, the movie Pretty Woman, um, where it was, you know, Julie Jill Roberts, Roberts and Richard Gere and, you know, some guy is going to sweep, you know, a prostitute off her feet and save her. Um, both of these things are not necessarily what sex trafficking is. Um, yes, there are people that get kidnapped, um, and that definitely does happen. But what typically happens here in New England is that a woman is groomed into this process by a guy that's promising her a great life, and then he forces her into doing commercial sex acts. And so the U.S. State Department actually has a definition for sex trafficking, and that includes force, fraud, or coercion. Those are the three things that you look for. Um, and whether that person is being forced or there was some sort of fraud or there was a coercive act um, to get this person to do either a job and they never get paid, so this is what labor trafficking is, or to do commercial sex acts, and this is what sex trafficking is. And so that is what trafficking means. It doesn't have to be going across borders. Um, so there's no like definition that says, well, you have to be crossing a state line or an international line, a country, a country line. Um, trafficking just means that somebody is being forced to do this and actually not making the money that is being exchanged for this. Does okay. that make sense? And it's not necessarily like limited to like what they call street walkers or the, the high, what they call the high society, high class um, what they call call girls, yeah. like this lady who had a, um, um, a romp with um, this former governor of New York, Elliot Spitzer, and she allegedly got $4,000 per episode with Elliot Spitzer. Right. So my question to her would be, is she actually making that money? Um, and that's usually the question that we have with all of these women. Are they actually making it themselves, or do they have to give it to some guy? And that guy is called their pimp. Um, and so this is what sex trafficking is. I mean, it's been around for years and years and years. We just haven't realized that this is something that's not really okay. Um, so we might look at this girl or woman and think, well, she's just a prostitute. But in reality, if you ask her questions, she's probably not making that money herself. She's probably being forced into this by some guy that's overseeing her and managing her. And she has no way of getting out of this. And she never chose to do this of her own volition. 
she was led along a path, lied to, and then was kind of forced into this. Okay, now, um, according to like your pamphlet and, and some of the information like on the internet about Amira, you have like, you operate, um, well Amira has like one safe house in the Correct. Boston area? Correct, so we have one safe home. Um, and what we do as an organization uh, is that we provide a refuge, a, a place for these women to come and break free from exploitation. And so we offer whole person care within our program. Uh, so we treat their physical, mental, emotional, social, vocational, and spiritual needs and help them recover through our program, which lasts for maybe a year to two years, um, and help them work through their trauma. And hopefully they reintegrate into society as who they're created to be and not somebody that's being forced to be something. Ah. So, like, some of the... Um, the rehabilitation to make them like whole. I, I noticed like in the, in the pamphlet it says, it talks about like um, tattoo removal. Yeah. Which if they're, you know, young and stupid, sometimes they get a tattoo or sometimes they get a tattoo sleeve on their arm, which... Well, actually the tattoo removal is because pimps will brand women. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And so they might have tattoos of their own, um, you know, with, which are their choice and you know, totally fine, but sometimes a pimp will actually brand a woman um, and put his name on her or put some you know, symbol that is symbolizing that she belongs to him. And that's not necessarily something that she wants to keep on her body. I don't um, blame her. Yeah. And so we work with companies that actually will help us to remove those things or cover those things and change them. And also, I noticed, like, um, teeth. Well, I, I guess, like, women's smiles and stuff like that. Well, and men's smiles, too. I mean, that, that means a lot. So they need, like, good dental care. If they had, like, big cavities or bridge work that they need, then... Yeah, so part of their recovery, for every woman that comes into our home and into our program that's being trafficked, uh, she more than likely is a drug addict. Um, this is part of the process. When she gets trafficked, I mean, can... Can you imagine saying a quota is normally 10 men a night? Um, that's not something that any, anybody wants to do. And so a pimp is going to get her hooked onto drugs so she can actually do that. And so all of the women that come to our home have a drug addiction. Um, and with drug addiction comes dental problems. Yeah. And so uh, dental work is a lot of, a lot of the recovery. Um, some of them have missing teeth. Um, they've taken beatings, unfortunately, um, and are missing teeth because of that. Um, and so there's a lot of dental care that has to happen. Ah, amazing, amazing. No, you're tell you also mentioned about making them, like, spiritually whole. Yeah. Like, you're not, Amira isn't affiliated with, like, a, a, a Christian church or anything like that. It's totally secular, correct? Actually, Amira is a faith-based organization. All right. Um, and so we're based within the Christian faith. Uh, so that means that everybody that works for Amira and that serves on the board is a Christian. Um, de depends on what denomination. I mean, we're not, we're interdenominational. Okay. Um, but that Amira has a statement of faith that we're doing this as a response um, of, from what has changed our life. So love has changed our life. And we have seen that these women were promised love and told that this is love. And that's so not what love is, what they're being forced to do. And so we would like to actually show them love. And this is what we know. Um, and so we're a faith-based organization, so everybody that works for us is doing this as a response to the love that has changed them. But we're never going to force our faith on them because we're never going to be their second pimp. All right. All right. But that spirituality makes... is a part of somebody's whole person recovery. So every single human being on this planet is a spiritual person depending on you know, what they believe in or, or whatever, every single person has a spirit. And the women that are in our home and in our program, um, you know, it's known that the average age for a woman to get trafficked, to be brought into this life is 14 years old. She comes to our home. Uh, we take women who are over the age of 18. On average, our women are in their mid-20s. So if she's been in this life for 10 years, can you imagine the questions that she has about whoever is out there, that this has been her life for 10 years, and why has this been her life for 10 years? 
And is somebody out there against me? And she's never been able to ask those questions. And so we want to help her ask those questions. And we want to help them ask the questions in whatever avenue they want to. Because again, I'm not going to force my faith on them. I'm just going to show them my faith. And so if they look at me and they say, Steph, I need to explore this through you know, Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever, I will absolutely let them do that because this is their choice. If they say, I want to explore this through Christianity, I will help them do that as well too. Um, and we help them kind of find you know, their faith and be able to ask God questions finally, which is a huge part of faith. I would assume, I mean, I can only imagine going through that type of lifestyle, but I think that the biggest biblical question I would have is the, um, the, um, the biblical scripture that goes something to the effect of um, that um, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. I mean, here they were making, you know, well, then again, I, I don't know if they, like you said before, that pimps probably make like 99% of the money or something like 100%. that. 100%. They don't keep anything. Yeah. They make 100 Okay. Because I was going to say, if they, you know, were getting paid by their johns or their clients, whatever you want to call them, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of bucks, although they weren't seeing it, yeah. going to McDonald's or Walmart, Although it's, it's more reputable, let's face it, they're probably getting minimum wage Correct. salaries. Correct. So there are three hurdles that are common for a woman to actually break free from this life. The first hurdle would be drugs. Um, the addiction piece is huge, and it's very, very hard for a woman once she's addicted to drugs. Um, you know, the heroin epidemic in New England is off the charts. Um, and so it's very hard, even for somebody that's not being trafficked, to break free from a heroin addiction. Um, so being trafficked on top of that, there's a mental and emotional addiction to these drugs to need them. And so breaking free from that is very difficult. So that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is that they actually could love this man. Um, so if she's 14 years old and a guy comes along and promises her the world and she has some sort of vulnerability in her life, maybe her parents never said that they loved her, maybe they're never around, maybe, they're, maybe she had a horrible uncle and the uncle molested her. Um, you know, something made her vulnerable. And so this guy comes along and promises her great things and becomes her boyfriend and tells her how much he loves her. And then, you know, brings her into this and all the while still says how much he loves her and that she only has to do this for a little while. She absolutely loves this guy. And so this is actually called Stockholm Syndrome where the, the captive actually falls in love with the captor. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a known yeah, mental I've heard of that. blockage. So this is a hurdle for them to break free from, um, to actually know and be able to say what is the boundary of a relationship and what is a good relationship and where have I been messed up. And that's a huge hurdle for some of these women. And then the third hurdle is a career, um, to be able to ask, what am I going to do with my life? And so if a woman has been in this life for 10 years or so, um, and really the 10 formative years where you're getting you know, high school education, college degrees, all these things. And this has been what her job has been. And she has no references. She can't list out her Johns. You know, she can't list out her um, yeah. employer or anything like that. She doesn't know what she could do. And so she actually might go back into this life not to be trafficked, but she might choose, well, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to prostitute myself. And so there becomes this vicious cycle, and it's, it's really, it's hard. Um, because, yeah, again, the prospects of, well, I can go down and work at Starbucks now. You know, uh. and, and it's unfortunate because some of these women are the most intelligent women I've ever met on the planet. Um, you Amazing. Know, yeah, and so they just need a shot. Well, they probably are street smart. I mean, there's Incredibly. common sense. Um, yeah. There's like, you know, intellectually smart people, and there's common sense street smarts. Right. And I, I would assume women like that would be survivors and yeah. uh, common sense. Yeah, they have an incredible uh, intellect to survive. I mean, they've been through things that we could not even imagine and taken things that we would never even be able to handle, and they have handled it. Um, albeit, you know with drugs or with whatever, but I mean, they have figured out a way to be able to do this. And so there is so much intellect there um, and helping them see the value of who they are is huge, the value of their self, their value of their body, um, and to help them take control of that 
is massive. Incredible. I once um, saw on TV, see, I don't know if this, it was a convicted felon talking about, um, I don't know if he was like a rapist or um, he, you know, um, like carjacked women or broke into the houses of women. But anyway, he was saying that he could tell like through body language on women that they would give off how vulnerable they were mm -hmm. on who his next victims were. Yeah. Is there like certain signs of some of these women that, you know, guys, uh, well, predator, predatory guys would look at and exploit? So, I mean, we know that within 48 hours of a girl running away, like becoming a runaway, she's going to get approached by a pimp. That's a nationwide statistic. Um, and so there is something about uh, a pimp is going to be able to see right away that this is a runaway girl from how she's dressed to how she looks to wherever she's hanging out. And she, she will get approached and she will get promised a great life. She will get promised a bed. She will get promised all these things and then taken into this life and no longer has all those things that she was promised. Um, so there's absolutely uh, the sense of vulnerability that they can prey upon and they can see. Um, and so I don't know how to necessarily stop you know, women from being vulnerable because there are horrible things that they have faced that made them vulnerable. I think it's a conversation to say, well, what have they gone through and how can we help to prevent by educating um, our children about correct boundaries with strangers, correct boundaries about sexual relationships, correct boundaries about um, you know, just being able to talk to people when somebody says something to you that you should question. Ah, uh, in fact, I we um, I emailed you earlier on um, God. I, I think that the show, the uh, made for TV movie, had to be like about 20, 20 maybe even thirty years ago with the a girl who played Jan Brady on the Brady Bunch. Okay, I think her name is Eve Plum, but she played an excellent. Um, like teenage prostitute out of Minnesota. Yeah. And I was just saying that if, like, if, I don't know, like maybe um, to get like a junior high program or a high school program to maybe a church group or something like that would show that movie and like stop it at certain places and see, you know, this is where she went wrong. These are the red flags to look for. Yeah. Don't, you know, be friendly to strangers, but don't be too friendly, especially if you're a woman, because women have, you know, right. a bad... Well, and there's, I mean, this doesn't just happen to women and girls. There are boys that get trafficked. That's true, too. Um, and so we are working to educate more and more. Um, you know, I get invited into high schools. Um, there are other organizations within New England that are working to prevent and talk to high school students about this is what this looks like and what can you do. And it's not just, in, I mean, like, yes, the average age is 14 years old because the demand is getting younger and younger and younger, unfortunately. Um, but this happens in colleges a lot. Um, you know, you're out at a bar, you're with friends, and some guy becomes, you know, your boyfriend. Um, and slowly but surely takes your life away. Incredible. Yeah. Do, um, well, not, not necessarily like women who are being sex trafficked and, you know, um, stuff like that, but do women in general look to have relationships with guys like their dads? Like, should they or? or sh well, yeah, should they or shouldn't? Uh, well, especially if the, the dad happens to be more abusive than a pimp or a drug dealer. Right. That's probably a dad you want to, a right, guy you want to say, I want to get married to any guy other than what my dad is like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's always a brokenness. There's always been some sort of brokenness that made this girl vulnerable. Um, and so it is hard, um, you know, if a woman comes into our home and into our program, uh, we talk with them about reestablishing relationships, and sometimes their parents were great people. And so we can help them to reestablish that relationship, but sometimes their parents were drug addicts themselves and you know, were part of what made them vulnerable. And so it might not be a good relationship to reestablish and to build a bridge again. Um, and so it's always very individualized on what we do there. Ah, uh, incredible. So um, now you said there's at least 18 beds in your safe house for the six New England states? There's 
18 beds, 17, 18 beds in all of New England. In all of New England, the mm -hmm. six New England states. Right. We have eight within our safe home. Incredible. So yeah. there's, uh, long story short, there's a, a very much a shortage. A lack of beds. <laughs> a lack of beds. Correct. And a lack of programs and a lack of services for this. So that's where like other, maybe other similar type, is, is there other similar type organizations like a mirror that are doing the same thing you are to help out? Yes, um, there's an entire coalition of safe homes. Um, and so there's the New England uh, Trafficking Aftercare Coalition, which is a coalition of safe homes. It's the four safe homes within New England. And there are more that are popping up, which is great. Um, okay. And we're helping you know, to get them going. It takes a lot to get a safe home and a program up and running. Um, it's not easy by any means. Um, funding is a massive part of it. And so you can imagine um, to run a home, like you have your own home and so you have your own rent or mortgage or whatever, all your utilities on top of that. So we have that, but then we also have the staff. We also have the programs um, for these women. And so it, it's, uh, not a small task that you have to do. Um, and so it's great to be able to say, well, yeah, we need more safe homes. Um, but the fact of the matter is, well, we need more awareness and we need more funding to be able to make more safe homes um, in order for this to actually happen with a model that works. So are the laws in this country, like well, Massachusetts and New Hampshire in particular, are the six, um, the six New England states, are the laws getting more stricter or more lenient for sexu sexual predators? Um, well, hopefully more stricter. Um, okay. Yeah. So Massachusetts was the 43rd state to pass their anti-trafficking bill. We were a little late in the game. Um, so we passed ours in 2012. So this essentially is saying that a woman that is caught in the act of prostitution is no longer going to be seen as a criminal, but now she will be seen as a victim. And she will be offered services to be able to get out of this rather than immediately just being thrown into jail. This is awesome uh, because this helps us to realize and reframe um, the idea that, well, she's not just a prostitute, but she actually probably is being trafficked and to be able to ask those questions of her and help her try to break free from this. Because again, it takes like three times because she has those hurdles to get through. And so um, we have these great laws and now we need to actually go after, okay, so if, if a woman is wanting to break free from this, finding a place for her, which is very difficult, we only have 17, 18 beds or so, but then also um, saying, well, we actually need to prosecute the pimps that are doing this, which is a lot of work. Um, I know that in the state of Massachusetts, there have been a, a few prosecutions that have come through in the past few months, which is awesome and great. But it takes you know, months and years to build up a case against a pimp. And they work within a network. And so you, you have to go after the entire network. Otherwise, you're just you know, taking one out and another one's going to be replaced. Um, and so it takes a lot for the law enforcement to go after the entire network, which they are. Um, now we're also trying to work on uh, actually establishing laws that are more strict against people that actually buy sex. These are the Johns. So right now it's a slap on the wrist. You pay a fine, uh, and that's about it. So uh, the Demand Abolition is an organization that's working to say, well, what can we do to actually prosecute Johns and uh, make strict prosecutions and strict uh, punishments for buying sex. And so they're working on those things. Ah, okay. Well, that, that definitely helps, as a, definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah, it is. So what is the average age? Did you mention that before, the average age of these? Of these women? Of these women, like in the safe home. So in the safe home, we take women over the age of 18. Okay. Um, and, you know, so our women range in the mid-20s usually. Um, some are in their 30s, honestly. The average age for a woman to be brought into this life is 14. And that's throughout all of New England. And really, I think that's throughout all of the United States at this point. Wow. Yeah. So, now, would that be like... Um, I would think that's they would, these are stricter laws pursuing like a, a person 18 or over or seven versus a, a, a girl who's like 17 or younger. 
there are stricter laws if a man is caught, you know, with a with a woman that's underage. Absolutely. Statutory rape. Or Correct. Something Think, like that. Yeah, <laughs> things like this. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the the problem does it becomes sticky once she is eighteen or over that. Well, maybe this is her choice. And I'm not sure why the age of 18, all of a sudden, this becomes her choice. Um, I've never met a seven or eight year old girl that says, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. So I don't know what ever allowed this to become her choice by the time she reached 18. Um, and so this is where we need to do a better job within our laws to say, we're, we're not just going to fight for these women when it's to the point they're 18, but even after, we're going to fight for them. Amazing, amazing. And, um, okay, I've just been told by my producers that we have just a couple minutes left for the uh, break. So I think we'll um, pause here, and we'll be back for the uh, second half of our show um, right after a commercial message. So I hope you join us for Frankly Speaking, and we'll be back soon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie Clark, and I'm the Executive Director for Amira. We're a faith-based nonprofit in the North Shore of Boston that provides a refuge and safe home for women that were sex trafficked. I know what you're thinking, sex trafficking, like that happens over in India or Cambodia, right? Well, actually, it's something that happens right here in New England. And the majority of women that are being trafficked grew up right here in New England themselves. And so what we do is we come in and we provide whole person care, helping them to break free from exploitation on their journey to liberation. We would love for you to engage with us about this topic. It's huge, and we need all the help that we can get. So you see our website right below me, www.amiraboston.org. Please go there, begin to check out what we do, and begin to see that you can actually become a partner with us in this incredible work. We also have a fundraiser coming up on Saturday, April 9th at the Ipswich Country Club in Ipswich, Massachusetts from 10 to noon. It's a brunch. There'll be incredible voices of hope there. A local survivor will be sharing a bit of her story. So we hope that you can join us for that great event. Again, uh, we're Amira. We're a faith-based nonprofit that helps women that are sex trafficked. We need you to partner with us in order to continue this great work. Thank you so much. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're here. Um, I'm here with um, the executive director of a group called Amira, uh, Stephanie Clark. She's the executive director. And it's um, all about, Amira's all about saving women from sex trafficking. Um, before we would talk about like spiritual matters, um, you know, you give uh, the women spiritual counseling. And I know there's a verse in the Bible. In fact, I think it's Jesus himself that's quoted as saying that to forgive those who wronged, wronged you seven times 70. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm misinterpreting that, but if that means that if one of these young girls forgives their pimp um, seven times 70, they could wind up like seriously injured if not dead. Oh, yeah. Well, I think there's probably a difference between forgiving them and allowing them back in their life. So for me, my understanding of forgiveness always means that you're letting something go and you're no longer letting it cause active anger in your heart any longer. And so for these women, that is a process that they could actually do, that they could let whatever happened to them go and allow God to heal their heart and to bring you know, restoration and love where there once was hate. So it's no longer bringing an act of hate any longer, that they're just letting that pain go. That doesn't mean that they actually interact with this guy any yeah. longer. Or, or send him like a Christmas card every Christmas. Yeah, I like really, I really card. doubt that. Yeah. Um, oh. So, I mean, our hope is, you know, that these men recognize the wrong that they have done um, and hopefully are able to restore their lives as well, too. Um, I'm never out to wish that, you know, this guy gets it all coming to him. I mean, obviously, I, I do want him to serve the time that he needs to serve. But I would hope that he would be able to recognize what caused him in his life that he thought that this was okay, that he could own another human being. Um, so what were the causes of that for him? There was obviously a brokenness in his story that that was a mentality that he had. 
And so for him to be able to ask those questions, for him to be able to restore his life, for him to be able to seek a whole new path as well too, I, I hope that he would be able to do that. And it's not just he, unfortunately. There are women as well too that are uh, quote-unquote pimps. Um, they're actually called madams. Um, and so there are women that are a part of this Heidi as well too. Heidi Fleiss, was that her name? Yes, out in California, right? Oh, Las Vegas or yeah. California? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are um, women that are a part of this too. Um, and so either way, what caused her, him, to think that this was the right? And what can we do to actually help them change their thinking and to change their life? That's a, a part that needs to be tackled. Wow. Just out of curiosity, um, well, I know there's a, a high like um, Muslim population, well, not really that much, but a, a decent amount of Muslims living in the United States. You probably are praying that Sharia law never, ever comes to the United States. Um, well, I don't know that it will. I think we have the Constitution, which is our law, so I think we're okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, I don't know if, like, if some like communities like Dearborn, Michigan, I heard the majority of people live in that community are Muslim. I don't know if they would have the right in, in the, uh, the way government works locally and statewide, if they could vote their people in or something like that, and something would change. I'm not sure. I mean, oh, okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure our Constitution kind of buffers the separation of church and state. So Okay. Uh, getting back, I, I was reading an interesting thing about, on, um, I did a, a mirror Google search, and I saw on Channel 7, WHDH, well, they did a, a story about um, the closing of one of the Amira homes. I guess it was Correct. last year or the year before you became the executive director. Right. And they were saying that, you know, usually like pimps like to, you know, go to the um, girls' homes if they're staying with their parents or something like that. Have they ever like tried to, because they're the criminal mind, they probably work like mafia. They'd probably try to like do investigations to try and find out where the halfway um, safe houses are and stuff like that. You never confronted one of these girls' pimps, have you? Or? No, I have not. Um, you know, most of the women that are coming into our program, um, they probably have broken free from their pimp for a while. Um, and so they might just now be living a life of drug addiction and that cycle. Um, and so when a woman actually breaks free from her pimp and chooses to leave him, he's lost kind of that mental... Um, hold over her, and he will move on. He's going to find another girl pretty much right away, and he'll be able to make money still. Um, and so we don't necessarily, um, yes, we're a safe home, so our location is not disclosed, and all the other safe homes, again, all the, the location is not disclosed. Um, and we work closely with the FBI and with Homeland Security to secure that these things stay the same. All right. Um, and we work as well to find out, you know, where these, these pimps are, if they're being prosecuted, if they're in jail, um, if they're being released, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're always kind of aware of what's happening. Um, and at the same time, we're aware of how we keep our women safe. Ah, well, that's, that's always a good way to, uh, yeah. do it. Instead of getting in confrontations with this, with those type of people, then you... Nope, we work with the women. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's probably good. No, I understand that Amir is going to hold a, um, a spring fundraiser on Saturday, April 9th at the Ipswich Country Club in Ipswich, Mass? Yes. Okay. So this is an annual event for Amira? Correct. Yeah. So we have an annual spring fundraiser. All right. um, and this time we're doing a brunch, which is a little bit different. Um, we found that it's never a great time to talk about sex trafficking, so why not do it over Eggs Benedict? There you go. Right. Um, so it's going to be a great morning. Uh, we're really treating this as a celebration since our home is open. Our home opened in October of last year. Um, okay. And so, so many things have come about in the past year um, between funding really taking a skyrocket and we almost tripled our monthly donors uh, since last year, which is incredible. Wow. Yeah, absolutely no, incredible. No, you also, um, it, I think it mentioned on that Channel 7 uh, WHDH piece that's on uh, the Google search, that you got a GoFundMe page? Yeah, so there was a GoFundMe campaign. Um, okay. And so between 2014 and 2015, 
when the house was shut down, um, the board had decided, well, we're actually going to seek to purchase this home rather than rent it. And so they did a crowdfunding campaign to get the down payment for the safe home, and they raised over 20%. And so we were able to purchase the safe home. So it's no longer a place that we rent, but it's actually ours, there which is go. wonderful. Yeah. Also, oh, you'll get tax things um, if you claim your, um, your, your uh, property tax and your uh, mortgage. That, um, well, we're a nonprofit. Oh, okay. Yep, so, that yeah. makes it even more better, I guess. Yes, it does. Okay. But at this, this fundraiser, um, it's, um, it's going to be called Voices of Hope? Correct. And you're going to have a survivor as the main speaker? So the voices that we're bringing in, um, one is a local survivor. Oh. Um, and so she was trafficked here in New England. Um, and she grew up right here in New England as well, too. And that's the majority of women that get trafficked here in New England actually grew up right here. It's not international women that are being brought over. That does happen. Yeah. And, and there are women that are like that here. But the majority of the majority woman that gets trafficked in New England is from here. And so she looks exactly like you know me or any other woman that's from around this area. Um, and so that's sometimes hard for people to hear because when they think about sex trafficking, they think, well, okay, this is like an Eastern Europe woman that's being brought here but a Chinese or yeah Vietnam or something like that yeah. the reality Mexico, is yeah, yeah she was she grew up in Maine she grew up in New Hampshire she grew up in Massachusetts so so yeah so there is a local survivor that's going to come to our Voices of Hope event and she does spoken word pieces um, and so she has a couple of pieces that she's going to share um, they're quite powerful and they talk about her time being in the life and what she has done um, to break free and recover from it She's an incredible voice, and we're so grateful uh, that she's going to come and be a part of our event. We're also going to have um, a professional um, within the medical field. Um, she's an ER doctor at Brigham and Women's, and she sees uh, many trafficking victims come through the ER. And she also helps with a clinic to help these women. And so she's going to come and share a bit about what her knowledge is being in the medical profession and seeing this quite often. Um, and then you have yours truly that's going to talk a little bit. Ah, okay. So it should be a good, um, a good event. And there'll be what, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon? Saturday morning from 10 to noon. 10 to noon. Wow. And people can buy tickets online on our website. Okay. And you, the um, website is available um, at miraboston.org? Correct. Okay. So um, as of the first time, well, I don't know if I met you per se, the past two years at Soul Fest at Gunstock, New Hampshire. Yeah. Either I met you or one of your colleagues. Correct. Were you there the past two years? I wasn't. So I think uh, this so past year there was a couple of uh, young volunteers that went up for us um, and enjoyed the concerts and then also sat by our booth. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say if you could give a shout out to uh, Soul Fest. That's one show that um, tentatively I hope to have either in April or May to promote the event. Yeah, Soul Fest is amazing. They do a great job. Um, last year they actually had a whole um, tent that was meant for um, sex trafficking awareness. And so they had Jasmine Marino, who's a local survivor, and she runs an organization called Bags of Hope. Um, she actually okay. shared her testimony of at Soul Fest, and um, they had a bunch of other organizations that are within New England. Are you familiar with Route One Ministries? Yes, with Bonnie Gatchel. Yeah, she's a wonderful woman. And no, she concentrates on like um, like the strip clubs Correct. in Boston. Correct. Yeah, because that's actually a gateway into trafficking. Um, you, because these women get forced into this um, to start before they get forced into prostitution. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you haven't per se been to a soul fest, but your your organization is correct. A part has of it, a yeah. kiosk or display table there. Yes, yep. too. They're wonderful people. We love them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, like I said, within the next couple of months, I hope to have somebody from Soul Fest here to talk about uh, Soul Fest 2016. But um, anywho. Um, Okay, so I, I'm been being told by my producers here, we do have quite a bit of time, like uh, over 14 minutes left. Is there anything, Stephanie, that um, I, uh, we talked about which you'd like to elaborate on or something that I didn't ask you about, Amira, that you'd like to bring up? Sure. I think 
you know, I think when people hear about this, they get discouraged. It's, it's scary uh, to think about the fact that right now there's, you know, a 14-year-old girl getting approached by a pimp, and he's lying to her, and, that, and that's frightening. And so some people can hear about this and become immediately dejected and immediately, you know, depressed and think, how on earth am I going to fight this? Like that, you know, I'm me in my own little personal world, and what kind of things can I do to stop this massive problem? Because it is a massive problem. Um, human trafficking worldwide profits $32 billion every year. So, and it's not just in the Boston area. No. I mean, you have Lowell, Lawrence, yeah. definitely have streetwalkers. Yeah. And maybe even Nashua. Nashua and Manchester here in New Hampshire Correct. probably has problems somewhere. Well, yeah, I mean, this is everywhere. And that's the thing. It's, it's hidden in plain sight uh, is the terminology. And realistically, the average John, the, the person that buys sex, is a 40-year-old white man with two kids at home. So yes, this is something that happens very much in you know, every area of every town. Um, there was a recent uh, data mining, um, so a, a organization, what they did was they looked at all the data that was coming through on Backpage. Backpage is essentially a CD Craigslist. Um, and so people post women on there all the time. And what they did was a data mining collection to find out how many ads are going up. And the average is about 5,000 ads in the Boston area in a month. Yeah. The second greatest area that was getting the ads, the North Shore of Boston. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're up against. We're, we're up against something that's very massive, that's all underground, that's you know happening all the time. This happens right in our hotels. Um, so a woman will get put into a room and the men will go online, they will buy these online, they will find out what time they can go to this room and then this just happens. Um, and so there needs to be a great work. If you work in hotels, you need to begin to ask, what can we do as an establishment to actually ask, you know, who are our guests and how can we stop this from happening within our hotels? Um, if you see something, you can always say something. There's a national trafficking hotline, um, and so you can Google national trafficking hotline, it's 888 number. There's a bunch of sevens and a bunch of threes, so I'm not going to say it because I'm going to get it wrong. But you can Google it. Yeah. And so if you see something that just feels off, you know, if you're driving past a nail salon or a massage parlor at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and it's still open and there are men walking in and out, it's probably a good time to call the trafficking hotline and just say, look, this is what I see. And they'll send cops to go ahead and investigate that out. You know, these things happen in all of our neighborhoods all the time, and we just don't realize that we can actually be a part of some a voice to say, well, what can we do to stop this? The other thing that we can do is begin to educate our communities. So whatever sphere of influence that you have, you no longer have to stay silent about this. This is the thing that I love about this work, um, is that this has been done before. This is called abolition. So somebody is an abolitionist if they are, are ready to stop um, slavery. And that's what I am. I'm an abolitionist. Uh, sex trafficking is slavery, essentially. This woman is being owned by another human being. I'm not okay with that. And so the history of abolition, um, there's a guy named William Wilberforce. who He was a British abolitionist. And he was a part of parliament. And he was a lawyer. All he knew how to do was talk. And that's all he knew how to do, and he did it quite well. Typical lawyer. Right, yeah. Yeah, okay. So he just knew how to talk. And he found out about the British uh, uh, slave trade that was happening between the West Indies um, and Africa and Britain. And so he found out about that and found out about the, the just atrocities that was happening, that there's all these um, men in Africa that are being bought or, or, you know, sold and then taken to the West Indies and being traded for goods that are being brought to Britain. And the fact that they are being put on these ships and shackles, that they're being taken from their families. He found out about all these things and he decided, well, I I'm going to stop this. And he's the one that is quoted saying, uh, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. And so we have known about this whole thing for so many years and I feel like we've just kind of chosen to look the other way. 
that, well, yeah, she's just a prostitute. But again, have you ever seen an eight-year-old girl say, well, I want to grow up to be a prostitute? That's right. And that's so, somebody's daughter that's, we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. And so you have to ask the questions of, is she actually doing this of her own volition? More than likely not. And so what can we do to help her? What can you do? You can be a big part of this. I mean, the biggest thing that every safe home needs is funding. There's not government funding on a whole for this. There are some federal grants. There are some state things. But you have to be existing for a long, long time. And right now, there are 17 beds in all of New England. And the longest one has been around for about five, six years. They have three beds. So they don't necessarily have a ton of numbers to give because they have three beds. So they're not going to get these huge government grants because of that. And so we need people to recognize that and to say, well, we're going to support you. And even if that's 25 bucks a month, that is still something. If I have 300 people giving me 25 bucks a month, that's half of my budget. That's less than a dollar a day. Yeah. And so it's something that we have to think about that maybe I can actually become a part of this by just supporting. And every little bit helps. I mean, people think that all the time. Well, I can't give 10 grand. I can't give 20 grand. But whatever you can give can actually help because we, otherwise we won't get it. So funding is always a huge part of that. Engaging the community and the sphere of influence you have, so whether that's a church community, whether that's your corporation, the work that you're at, whether that's you know, your, your community that you have, if you have like a book study or whatever in your home, engaging these people and saying, well, I'd like to educate them. And so we do awareness nights all the time. Um, and I'm happy to come speak at anybody's home, anybody's church, anybody's whatever, corporation, whatever, to share this is what sex trafficking is and this is how you can become a part of this work. And then find out what's happening within your own community. Maybe you live up in Maine and so you want to find the safe homes that are up in Maine or maybe you live up in Vermont and you want to find the safe homes that are up in Vermont. Um, wherever you live, you can find an organization that's a part of this and then maybe volunteer time. We run because of volunteers that are always willing to help us out, whether that's driving a woman to our appointment um, or helping us stuff envelopes. I mean, we run because volunteers are amazing for us. And so it's a huge thing to become a part of. So I would always encourage people that you shouldn't feel depressed and dejected like, I can't do this. Um, you know, the history of abolition tells me that something actually got done. You know, slavery was abolished in America once. I think we can do it again if we actually decided to have a voice in this. And so this is why we actually are calling our fundraiser Voices of Hope, because we're deciding to be a voice in this incredible work. Now, how many years have you had this annual event, this annual spring? Is it just a spring fundraiser? Do you have like summer, fall, and winter? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I don't know. I have everyday fundraisers, oh, right? Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, no, so we do a spring fundraiser, which is a big, you know, or a big thing, um, trying to get the whole community together to celebrate what's been happening. Um, and so we have 250 seats. We need to sell every single ticket. Um, and this is just a great time to come to celebrate uh, what's been happening. Um, I believe this will be our fourth oh. one. Um, yeah, so it's been an ongoing thing that's always happened every spring. Um, usually in you know the winter time, I try to do uh, teas because it's freezing outside, and so I go and I have tea with people and talk about the work that we do and begin to raise awareness within you know communities. But I speak all the time. Um, whether it's churches or corporations or wherever, just to raise awareness about this. Great, great. Yeah. So um, if this, is, if this um, uh, testimony here by Miss um, Clark, Miss Stephanie Clark, the executive director of Amira, has been a blessing, please consider um, you know, contributing to Amira. If, you know, not, if not like every month, maybe a one-time um, contribution. If you want her to speak like at a school or a town function or something like that, city function, um, the, the, the website is right underneath um, amiraboston.org yep. and um, she's more than willing to uh, come down or have a volunteer or a staffer come down and um, do like a lecture or a talk or something like that. Absolutely. And other than that, um, I can't think of anything else. 
Okay. But it's been it's been a, a very a very informative, very powerful show, I think. And um, so until next time, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Frank Sabrick from Frankly Speaking, saying uh, take care, God bless, and we'll see you on our next episode. Thank you. <music>